Welcome to this Atslander presentation. The topic, a different perspective on the Hopi creation story with Thomas O. Mills, a former manager of the Hopi Cultural Center. Take it away. All right, well, thank, thank you for having me, Jim. I appreciate it. And it's been nice knowing you for all these years. I appreciate all your help. So uh, I have a little different perspective on the Hopi creation story. I, I believe it can be proven. I believe it has to do with the Earth's tilt and uh, uh, our melting polar ice caps and maybe even a cure for our, uh, our uh, global warming. If, uh, if we follow their advice and, and just believe what they taught us. So, so here's some of the tobacco I grow for them. I, I sent it out there to them because they had a very bad drought and uh, they used to get it by their water holes and all the water holes dried up. So uh, they were out of their ceremonial tobacco. So I, I tried to raise it for them. So, and uh, I have to do it a special way. It, it's, uh, it's a chore, but uh, but anyway, I grew up in Winslow, Arizona, and I went to school there. And I rode my bike to school, and every morning I would pass the Indian dormitory where all the Native American kids lived. And I thought, well, those poor kids, their parents must not have enough money for them to go to school. And, uh, you know, they have to live in a dorm, and we're paying for the dorm and all that. And, uh, and they all had their hair cut, and they, you know, had the same clothes on. And it wasn't until I moved back up to the Hopi reservation when they asked my mother to open the Hopi culture center that I realized that uh, uh, those kids weren't there uh, because their parents didn't have the money. They were there because they were forced to go to our school system and learn the English language. But when I went up to Hopi, uh, I realized that uh, after about a year, that uh, all the Hopis have their own educational system and it's so, so good. It's, uh, they learn about arts, astronomy, how to construct homes that are warm in the winter and cool in the summer. They all uh, dance, uh, take part in their ceremonies. They know how to farm, how to fertilize, the fitness. They, they run between the villages to stay in shape. They know about germination. They have uh, guardians that come and teach them how to plant their food, how, how it needs to be taken care of. They have history that goes back. Uh, they have storyteller kachinas that come and, and teach them their history and their creation story. And, uh, and it goes on year after year. And, uh, and they don't have written uh, language, but they do have their, their history is, is a, a major part of their life. They, they know about mathematics, medicine, the Badger clan uh, knows all about healing, the medicines to use, the plants. They all compose music. Uh, their ceremonies have different songs for each uh, of their ceremonies year after year. They know how to preserve their food. They know about pollination. Uh, they have a wealth of religion. They know weaving and their arts and like the arts. And I'll show you some of their arts just to to get a little uh, uh, picture of what, what it's like up there. Second Mesa, this, she lives at Chimopavi and she takes her probably six months to make a basket like this. And uh, this is called a coil plaque or basket. And uh, if, if I was gonna marry a girl and I lived in Chimopavi and I was gonna marry a girl at First Mesa, well, her parents might make, uh, or First Mesa would make pottery and Third Mesa made wicker baskets. So they, they all had a different uh, balance of, of trade where, uh, I mean, it's not money, but it was just goodwill, you know, and it's some of the most beautiful art. Uh, this is, you know, uh, this frog woman, this is Dexter Nampeo. And their paint they use, uh, it's made from sunflower seeds and cedar root and they fire it with sheep manure and it lasts for centuries. It, uh, not like our paint that goes away in a year. The, you can find these shards out in the, that have been there for hundreds of years and they still have their paint. They make their dolls, which are, this is a white buffalo. Alvin James carved that. He was from Old Ribey and this is one of his eagle dancers. And 
and they always have pyramids on their uh, their kilts. But they were artists. Everybody's an artist, takes parts in the ceremonies. The men do this all year long. They make these dolls to give to their little, the their girl children, uh, so they remember how the, how their guardians looked when they were here. The little boys get bows and arrows and moccasins, but the, the girls get the uh, doll. And uh, the men also make jewelry. Now this uh, this was Charles Loma. He was a friend of mine. And this was Victor Kuchwaitma. He he was very good just with this silver overlay. And and then they're all painters. You know, this was Fred Cabotes. This is the home dance. And you might recognize this tablita from uh, like in the Queen's Chamber at the in the Great Pyramid. Well, uh, that's I believe it's all connected. These are the sashes they weave. This is the home dance where uh, the Kachinas leave, uh, you know, after the uh, uh, equinox and come they come back again on the winter solstice. And a friend of mine, Dave Riley, he he went to high school with me, and he he said we were walking backwards into our future. And I never did understand that till I started studying uh, uh, the cult, the creation story. So uh, he was a friend of mine in high school. Uh, Hartman Loma Wyman went on to work for the Smithsonian Institute. He worked in New York, Chicago, and he ran some of the biggest museums on earth. He came from Winslow, Arizona. Um, Oliver Kachina, he, he was a good friend of mine. I met him in a Kiva one night up there. But it's, uh, it's amazing how growing up, you, you're what you think. I, I realized later on in life that uh, they should be teaching us. We, we missed the boat here. So, because they can plant corn and their fields are out in these deserts where uh, Nobody can grow anything except puppies. I, I don't know how they do it. They're, uh, they know how to grow melons. They keep them in the sand in the summertime and they, and they come up cool in the, in, in the middle of the summer. They have cold water melon. It's just, uh, they're very, very smart. And there's a little girl with her doll and the harvest, which, uh, which is very good. So let's get into their ceremonial cycle. Their ceremonial cycle starts on December 21st, the winter solstice. Um, that's when the sun is, is in its winter home. And four days later, it starts back on December 25th. Well, this is when they start watching the sun to the east. And they watch the sun rising every day, you know, all the way until June 20th, the summer solstice. And then they start watching the sun set. So, so half the year, they're walking backwards, watching the sun go through its cycle. From January, February, they have the bean dance, March and April, the uh, plaza dances, uh, May and June, you know, here comes the home dance. And that's when the kachinas go back home. And then if the women take over the snake dance and the women's society, and then here comes the initiation. And then it starts over again on December 21st. So this is the cycle that it, uh, it rotates year after year. Um, and it, it's, uh, I know exactly what they're doing up there uh, just by, by this chart. So when they're out looking at the sun, you can see this is uh, Jim's uh, brochure, but you can see on the horizon how far they can, they can see. This is at Mashanga beyond Second Mesa. And they can look out here and pinpoint, you know, the sun's rise as it rises and sets, also the moon. And they know when it gets to the winter house and when it starts back. So if you, if you were in the sun clan, each Hopi belongs to a clan uh, from his mother. And his mother would have taught him or her, you know, this is our job. We watch the sun rise and the sun set. And these are the days we do it. And this is where it starts. And we have to have two or three points of reference. It might be a mesa or a hole out here that they've dug or a, a hole in a wall where the sun comes through and shines on their house. But they, they watch Earth's delicate balance all through the year. And not only do they watch the equinox, the winter and summer solstice, they watch the equinox and the halfway points between the two. 
So if you were gonna look at this on a compass, uh, you have a compass on your phone under your utilities app. And if you just pull up that compass and, and you can find where east is and this winter and summer solstice, the, the summer solstice would be on 60 and the winter solstice would be over on 120. So if you rotated that, you know, back and forth, you would, you would get this wow, the, the earth's chill. And uh, if, you know, if you were in the Sun Clan, you might say, well, that's good, Mom. Uh, that shows me a period of time. Uh, but how would, I, how would I look at a string of time, like a long period of time, you know? And she, she might write on her compass, well, let me mark it here for you. So this, here's east, north and south. And here's the, the summer and winter solstice. So if you rotate that back and forth, you know, that's what we call the peace sign or the life symbol in Egypt. That's the life symbol. That's our perfect balance in space, that tilt. That's our, that's where the crater gave us this little space where we're, we can survive here on earth. And he marked it with this, he gave them this information. This, this is the, the information that we need to stay uh, our survival. So, so if we wobble it back and forth very fast, you know, and pull it away like Earth's moving through space, well, that would give us a period of time longer than a year. It would give us uh, like a snake. And I believe that's why all past civilizations have used the snake as a as a tool for us and counts the wobbles. One, two, three, four. This would be the fifth, fifth time that we went through this cycle. So if you're very good, you, you might even put a constellation on each of these points. And then you could say, well, we're in Aquarius and we're going in, we're from the age of Aquarius now. You could go through these 360 degrees and you'd know by the constellations where we were in space. So you could, you could judge where we were, what period of time we were in, if you knew this information. And each one of these is, would be, uh, each degree equals 72 years. If you remember my friend's picture there walking backwards, he was talking about how the, we move backwards through the constellations one degree every 72 years. So each 30 degrees would equal 2,160 years, which is what we call an age. So I think this information is, is uh, in a lot of our ancient uh, uh, structures and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, I'll show you, it's coming up, but uh, it, it'd be the long string of time. So if you put a constellation on each one of these, and you think about the life symbol, and then you'd know where Earth was balanced just by right here. It'd be just like a gyroscope. You could, uh, and I think they use this in, in many locations. So where else do we have a snake uh, that's an, an ancient snake? Well, uh, there by Newark, uh, Ohio, they have what we call Serpent Mound. And that Serpent Mound, is a perfect example. It, it measures the summer solstice, the equinox, and the winter solstice. And then it points back at the summer sunset solstice, back towards the Hopi villages. The Hopi say that the uh, Snake Clan left this uh, monument for us, uh, but uh, I think it was the, the creator did it. I, there, there was an underground, another uh, a mound that shows that there was going to be another hoop here, like a the, this is the seventh time, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There was another extension right here that they left off, an eighth, an eighth wobble. But the foundations there, when they, when they use x-ray vision there or what x-ray, they find it. And they know that there's an eighth, eighth place there. So the Hopis uh, thinks that's as far as the snake clan went on their, on their migrations. These clan journeys they took in each direction as far as they can go. And they left this here as a marker that there was no stones there. So they built it out of mud and marked the summer solstice, winter solstice, and, uh, and uh, equinox. And this would be the, the long snake the, the, uh, uh, from the east. 
they have six different snakes for the six different directions. Uh, one of them's facing east, the boa snake, and then the water snakes for the south, gray horn snakes for the north, the black snakes for the west, and this flying snake, the whip snake, is the guardian above, and then below is the sidewinder, which is, you know, down in, in uh, Mexico and South America, you see the south, the, the rattlesnake is very important because it's vibrations, the earth, you know, like, just like the wobbles, they, they believe the earth has a backbone. And as these polar ice caps are melting, we're gonna get a increasing wobbles and our vibration is gonna go off and that's when we're gonna be in trouble. So that's their warning. So this is from down South America and this would be like the sunrise, the, the serpent watching the sunrise and this would be the sunset. So. Now, another place where there are snakes is at Chaco Canyon over in New Mexico, which is an ancient site. Uh, uh, they say that it's built by the Anastasi, but I, I'll go into that a little bit. Uh, so here you'd see the, the horn snake, you know, which, uh, let me back up one, two. The horn snake would be the one, uh, let me, let me, horn snake would be for the north. So we know that's the Norse snake, and he's seven times. One, two, three, six. This is the seventh time, and he's on his third wobble. So this is the third time and uh, the, from the third, third world. So at Chaco Canyon, they have these spoiled snakes uh, on, a, on a, a rock about the size of your pickup hood, uh, hood of a pickup truck, and those, those uh daggers of light come down and mark exactly where earth is in this cycle there's a very good video out that's for free on youtube called the mystery of chaco canyon and it was done by anna safari and narrated by robert redford they stayed up at the culture center and uh, nice nice people and uh it took her 30 years to make this video and she she explains how all those Four large buildings are aligned with the sun, and there's seven large buildings aligned with the moon. And uh, the moon is very important when you start talking about this tilt, Earth's tilt. So this is, uh, uh, it was built by the bow camp clan because the, the it looks like a bow. And then here's a rattle, which is an underground Kiva Chaco Canyon. But I've never heard a Hopi say anything about an Anastasi. The Anastasi is a Navajo word. And there was a guy that, uh, a ranch hand that was uh, trying to uh, steal things at that site way back. And he ran off the Navajo people. He was mean to them. And uh, they always, when anybody asked him, you know, what is Chaco Canyon? Where did it come from? They always say it's the Anastasi. My, and they called him the ancient enemy. But uh, he, you know, there, there is no Anastasi. These were built by the guardians, the Hopi guardians that uh, brought them here to America and taught them things and uh, told them exactly where to live. So uh, there's, if you watch that video, you'll see that there's no fireplaces in those rooms. There's 700 rooms in some of those buildings and there's no, no, no ventilation, no furnace, no fire. Uh, there's no water, there's hardly any burial grounds. Uh, there's no places where fields were built and there's no trash sites. So I don't believe that they were built um, by the Anastasi for one thing or anybody else. I think they were built by the guardian that brought them here, Masao. And I think he uh, built them for future generations for when we learn this knowledge about the winter solstice, the summer solstice, that we join what the Hopis are thinking and we might go back there and have a reunion and uh, let, it, let the creator know that uh, we understand what's going on. So I think that's why it was built. I don't think anybody ever lived there. But at the site, you have these three stones that allow the sun's light to come in and the moon's light and give you the exact location of the winter, spring, summer solstice and the equinox. So when the sun comes down, it, it marks the equinox on both snakes, you know, it hits both of them. Then the summer solstice sends a white dagger of light right down the center. 
the fall equinox, there again, you got the, it's the same as the summer equinox. And then that shows your earth is in perfect balance. And then the winter solstice, it goes just on uh, the opposite side of the snake, both, both sides. It's just a miraculous thing. I don't think we could build it today. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, we, we it, 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 in fact, one of the, the rocks shifted and we can't get it back where it works again. So there was somebody very smart that built that. Another place you might take a look at is uh, uh, a place over by Los Alamos in New Mexico. And the name of that page, the uh, in under YouTube, is nearby archaeology sites. And they found this. Chuck Keller found another site where the daggers of light uh, make a, a, an entrance during the winter and summer solstice. So where else is there snakes? Well, if you if you look down in Mexico. Here's this Aztec sunstone. If you look at that with what the Hopis have, have in mind, with their, their first balance and the gyro, gyroscope and, and where we're at with the snakes, you see that there's two snakes and their heads are down here and they've got one man inside each head. I would think that would represent the first world and the second world. So this guardian would be here from the third world and he's got his hands on the controls and he's trying to balance earth. You know, it's, it's uh, rotating through these constellations of the snake. Each snake has six fins on it, which, you know, represents your flying snake, I would guess, but uh, I've never seen any snake with six fins, but there are six on each side. So that would tell me those are the 12 constellations. He's in the middle here trying to balance. You see there's little wheels here, here, and there, and there, and uh, down here. And he's he's just like in a gyroscope, trying to center the earth, trying to balance the earth. And uh, I think the whole thing was uh, built just to show that rotation, the, the winter solstice, summer solstice. And then they have their own set of constellations and their own uh, time frame. And so on this pyramid, uh, Here's the snake, and when it's the exact time of the winter solstice and the summer solstice, these, the shadows form the snake going up with six humps on each side, and it comes down to the base. And whoever built that had to have an understanding of the Earth's tilt, where we are in space. And if, if it doesn't work, we know we're out of balance. We know uh, that we're in trouble. So again, here's a pot that uh, he's got the same thing, two rattlesnakes. He's got a hold of each one and there's six square boxes on each side. And same thing here, he's got, he's got the two snakes. He's trying to balance the earth. So that's what I read into. And down there, there's also murals that show uh, the two guardians pulling a snake uh, and this reminds me of a Hopi dance that uh, this is the, the butterfly maiden and she comes uh, every four years or so and she grinds corn and and she, it's a mural was set up inside of a kiva and she, the, the, the mud heads, the koyemsis come in and just uh, can't pour enough corn in there. She's grinding it and, uh, and then they haul out the corn meal. But on each side of her, I couldn't find a picture of it. I've, I've seen the dance. Each side of it, there's a, a pot and there's a snake in each side. And they, when the, they have Zuni warriors here and when they dance, the serpent goes up and down in the pot and she's grinding and everybody's singing in rhythm. And it's, uh, it's really a beautiful dance. But this mural reminds me of that when I see these guys pulling on these snakes, you know, so. Um, all right, so if you get back to the, 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 the life symbol, and we know what that means, uh, I hope, uh, you see that in the murals of Egypt, you know, this, this twin, I call them, is feeding the new initiate uh, the life, the information. And the third world is there patting him on the back, welcoming him to the fourth world, this world we're living in. So to me, this mural would be very important, it's uh, the backbone of the earth, the, the three times, first, second, third worlds. The life symbol is standing on its, on the, it's balanced and it's in our human hands. So that tells me that the creator 
is expecting us to correct this problem that he's he's uh the moon is out if the moon is drifting away from us we need to consider bringing the moon back into uh to protect this tilt our, our earth's tilt and that's repeated over and over here this the rays of the sun are given us hand and uh, you know that's the sphinx and and then there's a serpent right there. That's where we should take the measurement, right? The base of the sun, not, not in the center, but that's what the, they were telling us where to get a helping hand, you know, from the, from the mural. So in Egypt, there's, there's a lot of snakes. And uh, in this, this mural, an ancient one, uh, here's four times that we've gone through the 12 constellations, just like the Hopi said, four paths of 12s. And here's your 12 constellations. In this mural, um, I'll, I'll explain this later, but the snake is at a right angle, which means you're gonna be, a, it's a right, the right angle is the end of the path. And this mural you won't create at this angle. So it's all about the angles. And here's here's the beetle that uh, is rolling, rolling the earth, uh, the dung beetle, I call it. And I'll explain that a little more, but I'm just showing you where there's some snakes. Here's a mural in Egypt. This was in Ramsey's tomb. Huge mural. I'm gonna explain the whole thing to you, but uh, there's uh, they're dancing with a snake. Man has two sides, and then the beetles rolling us over again. And you know, the, you count the wobbles. You know, this is the fourth time. So, so at Chaco Canyon, they're not just measuring the sun. The 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 daggers of light come down on the summer and winter solstice with the sun, they also measure the moon. And it took her 30 years to figure this one out. And uh, the, the midpoint marks the very edge of the, the, the snake, coil of snake. Right at the center is the extreme moon and then the maximum moon. And uh, I never knew that the moon had uh, a starting and stopping point like the sun, but it takes, you know, 18, 18, uh, you know, nine and a quarter years, 18 and a half years total for the moon to go through this cycle and back. So, if, and this was at Chaco Canyon. And so people would have had to live there for at least 18 years to, to know this moon cycle. But, but somehow whoever created that site knew about it. And, uh, you know, and the moon is what controls our tilt controls the tides, it controls our season, controls the jet stream. And if you're the speed of the earth, which controls your temperature, you know, if the earth is running fast, you're gonna be uh, cool. And if it's running slow, you're gonna get hot. So uh, the moon was very important to these people. I, I know I'm rushing, I'm trying to get all this in because it's, it's gonna take me a minute to go through all this. but. The other place they measured the moon cycles was near Serpent Mound there at uh, Newark, Ohio. And it's the same thing. They measured the exact, you know, maximum, minimum. Uh, so they're very concerned about the moon. And, uh, uh, and we don't even know how the moon got there. We, you know, we, we speculate that another planet hit our planet and they forget their big bang theory because, uh, you know, somehow the, material of the moon it was formed in exactly this perfect place that uh, it's just uh, pretty far-fetched. Something it had to put the moon exactly where it's supposed to be up there. And uh, I think there he's waiting for us to figure this out. But uh, the moon standstill points were measured in many places uh, in Japan and uh, Italy. Um, here it was in India. And when the moon gets to its standstill point and starts back again, uh, it, they measured that exact spot, you know. And in other words, the Earth had to be in exactly the perfect balance for somebody to build that where it would hit that hole at exactly the right time. So let me tell you a little bit of the story. Let me just go through it briefly. It takes the Hopi a whole day to tell the creation story. Uh, a Masao comes and, and talks to the young children. He, he's a kachina that can come any time of the year. And he comes and he gets in the key and talks to the children and tells them this creation story. So, um, 
So the first world, the creator, was traveling through space. He was just like us. He was traveling through space, and he wasn't alone. He, he, uh, he was with his nephew, which tells me that he had, a, had to have a, a sister, and she had to be married, and he had to have parents. And they found Earth, and, and Earth had a problem. It was out of balance. It was wobbling in space. That's not to say there wasn't dinosaurs and uh, ancient animals living here in water, and, uh, but the, the earth had a problem. So, uh, so he was with a, uh, his nephew and a woman called Spider Woman, and he told them, we're going to fix this problem, and uh, you're the nephew and Spider Woman, and we're going to stay here on earth. He uh, had a plan. Like any good businessman, he... He was when he starts a project, he had a plan. So today, when when these guys talk about going off into space and starting something in Mars or but yeah, uh, the Hopis know that that won't work. That there's nothing on Mars. That they know that uh, they came from further away than that. And uh, uh, you know, you're they're wasting their time. And what and how are they going to do this? Are, what are they going to are they going to take? jet engines up with them up there and pollute Mars or, you know, we'll have, they have to have a plane. So, so he told the nephew and the, and the spider woman that he was going to do it seven times for this world and nine, nine times total and seven times for the worlds to come. So the one time was for him and his nephew and then seven for the worlds to come. And we're on the fourth one. They said on the seventh time, the creator will be on top. Uh, that'll be his time to refresh and restart a period of regrowth. The earth has to heal after, after what it goes through. So, uh, so to correct the problem, the creator told his nephew to arrange the nine planets and moon in general order and place water on air in each one. So it's no news to the Hopis when the scientists discover moon, the moon and Venus and Mars has water. I mean, they, they've known this the creation story was written by Frank Waters in 1963. So uh, they knew this many years before that, you know. So that was his first attempt was to arrange all planets in general order. And that's important. And I'll tell you a little bit about it later. But uh, you know, we really don't know where how our moon got there. And so the nephew then instructed Spider Woman, Spider Woman to solidify the Earth. And I believe she did this with the pyramids. You know, after she did this, after she built the pyramids, got the earth rotating properly in this perfect balance with the moon, uh, two twins formed on each pole on our polar ice caps. So, so what's a twin that's on each ice cap? Each polar ice cap, it's the ice. You know, so when she got it into balance, the earth uh, ice caps formed. The twin on the North Pole was for balance, and the twin on the South Pole was for vibration, the backbone. It's uh, just like we have a backbone. They say the Earth has a backbone. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what the hope is in the vibration. You know. So this, this, this was his second attempt to solve Earth's wobble. It took both of them to do the job. So, so that's how, how the first world started, when they got the Earth ready. So Spider Woman then created the trees, the bushes, plants, flowers. She went all over the universe and brought back everything we need to make this the perfect place for us. He tried to make it where humans could uh, survive here uh, and just be happy and healthy and, and have their children. And first attempt, they tried four males and four females, and, and, but something went wrong. The, the creation, they couldn't speak and they ran with the animals. And I, I think these were the Neanderthals. This was their first attempt to, uh, to get it right, to get, to get a, a human beings here on earth, you know. So she called the nephew and he gave her the power to correct the problem, but he, he didn't destroy the Neanderthals. He let them continue. He let them live. And then he created four new, four males and four females of each race. So that would make four black, four red, four white, and four uh, yellow. So you're talking 32. Well, it just so happens that at Chaco Canyon, there's 32 large kivas. 
So I think that's, you know, part of the, uh, you know, what, what to expect is to go back there, all four races, not just one race, you know. So all he asked in return was to respect the creator and sing and gave praise. And then he gave him corn, which is a big thing. Uh, on this uh, page here where I was looking up about corn, the first thing they say is that the corn, uh, not one, grow, grows in the wild. Corn doesn't grow in the wild. It, uh, yeah, they say that uh, these hunter-gatherers combined two seeds and came up with corn. And, but you can't go any place on earth and find corn growing without somebody taking care of it. It doesn't happen. So so where did our corn from come from? You know, and and they, they go on to say that the creator gave uh, each race uh, corn, you know, uh, but the whole piece waited and they got the last year, which was a little, uh, a little year and it grew close to the ground and didn't need much water. So that's where they got corn. And uh, corn, if you think about it, what a, what a blessing it is, how you can grow it in one year and each year gives you enough corn seeds to make a whole field the next year. And uh, here we are, in our wisdom, we're using corn to make fuel. When, when there's countries and, and you know starving to death, children are starving, and we're we're using our corn to make fuel. So um, it's just you know the way we do things. Um, so these four races went forward, and they didn't go very far. They just had a few villages. Little uh, they started using their vibrating centers for earthly purposes. Forgot the plan of creation. And then this little voice came to him, kind of like a, a mockingbird started talking to him, convinced the first people that they were all different from each other. And a big headed snake came and led the people further away from the crater and wars broke out between the different races. So something had to be done. So the nephew called the people who still had sung to the crater, still respected him to a large hill pyramid where they could be protected and live with the ant people who fed him and while he destroyed the first world by fire. So fire came from above and below, all the volcanoes opened up, the earth went out of balance, nothing was left but the people inside the anthills and the first world's direction was west. So it took some time for there to cool off and it had, and, and when it, it changed. So the water was where the land had been and the land had been where their water had been. There was nothing to remind the chosen ones about the previous wicked world. The ice caps must have melted if the water uh, went over all the land and, and the islands. And, and uh, you know, the water only comes in three forms. It's either water, ice, or vapor. So if it's not ice, what, what's it gonna be? It, it, our weather's gonna change, it's up in the sky or it's, it's gonna be water and we're gonna have floods. So, so that's how the first world ended and there was a few people he saved. So then the nephew came to the anthill and he stomped on the roof telling the people climb up the ladder and enter the second world. They also say he rolled back the door, you know, so uh, I, I've got a picture here of some, uh, those uh, in Turkey where they have these huge underground uh, build uh, tunnels that are could hold 30,000 people and they have round doors on them. And I think that's where, you know, this is where he took the uh, people to protect them. So they climbed up into the second world and this, this direction of the second world was south. He again, told the crater, sing and dance and to praise him. They multiplied rapidly in all directions and built homes and roads. So this time they got a little more advanced, even on the other side of the world. So they moved all around the world. Then they began to trade and barter with one another. And even though everything was provided for them, they wanted more. So just, just like our little bird talking to us, you know, you got to make money. You got to go. You got to have more, more, more. So soon they forgot to sing praises to the creator. And again, wars broke out between the towns and the villages. A few still led by the, the teachings of the creator. And again, the nephew led them to uh, the ant hills. And this time, the nephew commanded the twins, the ice caps, to leave their post on the north and south poles. With no ice on the poles, the earth teetered off balance, spun around crazily, then rolled over twice. Mountains plunged into the sea, sea sloshed over the land, and the earth spun through cold and lifeless space and froze. 
So this happened as if their thread of time was running out. So the, the crater is measuring this long thread of time. This the snake we talked about at the beginning. He's 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 watching this thread of time because uh, I think the Earth is getting closer to the sun and the ice caps are going to melt. Our our wob our orbit isn't a perfect circle around the sun. So he's trying to teach us this. So once again, the nephew stomped on the underground anthills, told people of second world to come up into the third world. Its direction was east. This time they really advanced rapidly and they built big cities, countries, a whole, whole civilizations, which could have been down in Mexico, could have been. The, they soon forgot their teachings and became, became wholly occupied with their own earthly plans. Some built flying shields and flew through the air, attacking other cities and returning so fast that no one knew where they came from. So this is just what we do today with our drones. You know, uh, we have this flying machine that goes over there and attacks somebody and comes back, you know, and here we are, uh, in, like in Ukraine, you got white people killing white people. And in China, the, here we are, they're gonna attack Taiwan or something. Why? I mean, what are we, what are we doing? You know, I mean, uh, you know, this is in Africa, there's big uprisings right now. We should, uh, be, be thinking about this Hopi creation story. So, so this time the, the nephew said, well, there's no time waiting until the thread runs out. This time, you know, we're gonna do something with the people with the songs in their heart before they get killed. We're gonna do something uh, before the, the three thread runs out. So he instructed Spider Woman to put the people in hollow tubes or reeds. She then put white cornmeal dough inside with food and sealed them up. Then the nephew destroyed the third world by water. So, so again, the polar ice caps melt. If we knew what time that was, we could maybe find out how this, what time frame they're talking about. And I'm gonna explain that. This time they floated east for many days and then stopped at a point and built rafts and paddled across a large ocean always traveling towards the rising sun. They then found a large mass. They traveled north to their present villages. Again, the polar ice caps must have melted. So the fourth world's direction is north. When they arrived here on the, in the Americas, Masao, their guardian, the caretaker of the land greeted them. Uh, he re they recognized him from the third world. So they'd already seen him before, you know, and he, took, he then gave them permission to occupy the land and the people coming down from the north were gonna do so without his permission. Masao then directed them to the exact location he wanted them to sell. So this, this is where we're at today. Masao also gave them stone tablets, two of them, uh, the fire clan tablet, and he broke off a corner of it. And he told them, uh, you know, someday, the, this knowledge is going to come out and the guy is going to have the corner of this stone is going to, you'll know that all this is true. So, so that's where we're at today. So here's a picture of those underground uh, ants, I call them over there, Turkey. Here's this round door that, the, you know, uh, had to roll it back and let them in and out. But they said over 30,000 people could live in these things. And the guy found them just by his remodeling his house and knocked down a wall. And uh, it, they go down, you know, uh, so many levels. I don't know if they've even found them all yet. And this is a picture, picture graph from the, the a book of the Hopi. It's a carved in stone. So like we're talking about the snake, how many times this would be the third world. And they went through the pyramid, the fourth step pyramid, because this is a fourth world. And here we are in the fourth world. So, you know, it's the, the pyramids helped us get from third world to the fourth world. So this would be the long string of time of this wobble, this, 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 uh, the two orbits we showed. One of them is if, if Earth was in a perfect balance and the other one's this tilt, this 32, what is it? 32, uh, 23.44 tilt. And as we go backward through this, uh, the, the constellations, like I talk about when Earth hits this main point here, that's the spring rocks. And that's where we can tell exactly where we're at, that we're, we're uh, 
we're in, in Pisces heading into Aquarius. You know, I know that from that song, you know, Age of Aquarius. But so if we were to start uh, back four, four ages, we would get to Gemini, the twins. So once again, the Hopis are correct. You know, here we are, the twins started it. You know, we've gone through these, these ages and, uh, and you, can, you can get dates from this, uh, you know, into the, the past and into the future. And, and uh, we're gonna hit the age of Aquarius on the equinox on March 20th, 2100. 2100 is exactly when most scientists say that those ice caps are gonna be completely melted. So, um, so what would we have here on earth to, uh, to show us this? One thing was the ceiling of Dendra. Here's your two paths. And this was inside the, the big temple and uh, Napoleon blasted it out and took it to Italy. But uh, it shows the constellations as we go through them. And here's the 12th one is uh, the crab, which is going to do uh, seven. And uh, I think that's why this crab's on that in Golden Tech buried is because uh, that was one the crater used before he started us on our journey. And uh, these three bags, every, every Hopi village has a, a guardian that takes care of a little bag of earth and keeps it in balance. So uh, that might be what these represent. So how did they get, get those uh, constellations and know exactly, uh, you know, how did they chart those where they were in our night sky and we could watch them because each one moves one degree every 72 years. So a human being only lasts 72 years. I could look up at the sky every night and I'd never notice the difference. I don't think anybody would. So uh, what they did when the pyramid, the Great Pyramid was half built, they had this grand gallery. And in the gallery, there's slots. And if you put a platform there, you could, you could chart you know, the stars going by and make your constellations and plant and then carve them into the ceiling of Dender. So they, they use these slots to move it up and down, just like we do with our pyramid, our observatories today. So when it was half built, that they needed a steady, secure platform to measure those things. And that, that's why the Grand Gallery is at that tilt. So here again, this is from uh, uh, Peter Thompson's Secrets of the Great Pyramid. He shows the two interlocking where that where that where the two paths cross, you know, that's where the time changes. And 2100 is the next one, minus 60, minus 220, and way back to 4380. So uh, these figures just keep popping up the 1080, the 2160, the 4320, and the 8640. All those would just, when I, we talk about stone hands here in a minute, uh, all those, they just uh, keep showing up all uh, through all of this. So the one path you would have your, here's the, uh, the dog, uh, what do you call oh, Cyrus, and then Orion and the Pleiades. And the Hopis watch those three very religiously. They know when to start their ceremonies uh, when Orion comes through the Kiva door. I've watched him build a Kiva and it took him three years to get that door just perfect where Orion would enter it, and that's that's when the, the the midnight dances would start. They didn't start midnight; they started whenever Orion got there. And then your constellations are on the other path. You know, here's your Gemini, your Cancer, Leo. So this is from a book called The Mayan Prophecies, and uh, it's a good book. And uh, but the right where those paths cross, that's that's where you where you get these dates. So you can tell when things were built. And Orion and those the ones we're talking about go are going up. They, they go up on the on the horizon, on the meridian line, and then your horizon is where your uh, the constellations are. So so when Orion, the spear hits the bull, say well, that's that's in one of the murals. And this is the way they look up in the night sky. 
the Hopis watch them very, very closely. And what we need here on Earth would be a place to measure. And where, what you need is like a clock. So that's where the Sphinx is. The Sphinx is facing due east. Here comes your, your ecliptic path with the constellations on it. Orion's over here to the south coming up. So I'll tell you about these, these uh, what these figures are here in a second. I think they're like hieroglyphs. And here's your winter, winter solstice, your summer solstice, all lining up with the pyramid complex. And these constellations are going by letting us know where we're at in space. Now the Chinese have their, or the, excuse me, the Asian people have their own set of constellations, but here you are with the same two paths. Uh, the creator gave guardians to each race and taught them this information in the beginning. So, uh, you know, the black man should have it and you know, we should have it. And, uh, you know, it, the Native Americans sure have it. They know about it, but uh, that, that cross right there, that's what they're looking at. So one of their constellations is a rabbit. Here's he's cutting up a snake with a prayer feather on the second, third wobble, third wobble. So, and they say there's a, a, a 13th constellation and naturally he's bringing a serpent, the snake. And that's right, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure where it's at there, uh, I just wanted to show you that, that there's speculation that there's another constellation and the, he's bringing the, the serpent, the snake, which is about our wobble. So Charles Hapgood wrote a book in uh, uh, 1950, I believe, somewhere in there, that uh, he and Einstein were thinking of how the North Pole, if it was, had ever changed its location. And they went around the Earth and looked at uh, volcanoes because when a volcano lavas hardens it always points to the north and they found out that the north pole had been in different locations at different periods of time but their thought was that it was because the earth was like an orange and the, the outer shell was shifting and uh, i believe the hopis i think uh, you know i think there's a rotation so there's a transition of the pole you know 100,000 years ago 75,000 years ago and then 50,000 years ago, um, you know, 25,920 is the time it takes to get through this cycle. And then Hapgood had evidence of a shift at the 25,000 mark. It was on page 173 of the path of the pole. And that would, uh, uh, he, he didn't use it because he thought it was too early for his uh, assumption. Well, scientists aren't supposed to make assumptions, but he had evidence of 25, so you had this regular period of, of transitions, 75, 50, 25, and then it should have gone you know, to the present day, but instead at 12,500, it came early. And that's the last time the ice caps melted and there was a great flood. And that's just like the Hopi said, that the last time came early, you know, half the distance. So Hapgood also had the ability, he marked where these pole locations would have been. And, you know, if you use those as a template and uh, if for something like Stonehenge, you know, uh, I, I always thought Stonehenge should have lined up with the equinox. They, they have it lined up with the solstice and think that's good because if one thing is lined up. But I think the whole complex was built uh, to show us the winter, summer, solstice, moon cycles, the, the whole thing we're talking about here. If you just took our little compass with your equinox and then your two halfway points in your summer and winter solstice and used it just like a gyroscope, you'd have your 60 outer stones and this would point straight east. And the six, you know, here's these figures again. If, if you, if, you know, 30 large stones in the outer circle, I'm sorry, there's 30, uh, divided into that 25,920 would give you 864 years. Each one of these would be 864. Each one of those would be 2160. So here's your, your ages going around in our gyroscope. The next one has your 60 cycles, but those are littler stones, blue stones. And so 60 into 25,000, here's your 432. And then the 
10 large stones would be, uh, you'd know it's 864 times 10, so that'd be 864. So this is the fourth world, uh, 2160 into 80, you know. And then your center one, there's 19 stones, but <clears throat> that center stone, <clears throat> excuse me, is a, uh, uh, should mark the equinox. And you would split that stone in two. So then you'd have 20, 20 stones, and 20 stones times 432, because we got the 432 from there, would give you, uh, again, 864. So uh, one guy standing in the center of stone hands on the day of the equinox, would, it would show 12 different points of reference, just like a, a gyroscope. And it would show you north, south, east, west, where we're balanced. And, uh, and the only trouble is it, it, wasn't, it isn't pointing east right now. East is over here, but if you go by Hapgood's point of view, it points right at where Hapgood said the North Pole would be, you know, 11,000 years before Christ or 12,000 years ago. So I think these ancient sites, if you have this secret, you can, you can plot when they were built. You know why they built them. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, to me, it, it's, uh, this is a hope he painted this portrait of him and that's the sun the earth and the moon well that outer circle the at stonehenge is the radius is 50.4 so that that's the outer radius the small blue stones uh, same as the earth it's uh, its radius is 3960 its diameter is 7920 so it's you could fit earth right in there and the sun would be around it. And then if you subtract those two figures, 50.4 from the 39.6, you get 10.8, which that's the diameter of the moon. So they were showing us the distance from the earth to the sun, the earth to the moon, and it has to be in a perfect balance. That's why we have eclipses. That's, that's why the, the stones down at the uh, Easter Island are, are looking at the eclipse. They're not looking out to sea. They're looking at the eclipse. It's a perfect place to watch, you know, that we're in perfect balance, you know. So if you look at this, you see this, Gerald, he, he's very connected. He's, he knows uh, this is the fourth world. There's four stars on each side. Then he's got nine on one side, seven, seven and nine. Then he's got the 12 constellations, the sun and the moon. And here we are with our uh, water, our kiva, our canes, so we can get old. There's our snake, our path. Uh, it's got frogs and fish and uh, kivas and corn, lightning and rain, and it's, uh, it's, it's our blessing. It's our earth. It's right there. So, so that's what Stonehenge is about to me. And uh, um, they wanted us to know this information. It, it's a, uh, it's, it's uh, exactly what we need to know. The diameter, the moon's diameter is 400 times smaller than the sun, and the moon is one four hundredth the distance between the earth and the sun. So the Hopis believe this is the fourth world, and it kind of bears out that. So, uh, so if you look at that rattle that was back at Chaco Canyon, you. Uh, and compare it to the rattle the Hopis use at every ceremony and how they had this information on this ancient rattle, you know, uh, the direction of the earth, the direction of the sun, how we travel around the sun. They, they knew all that. They knew Neptune was blue before we did. They knew. They, uh, they know things, you know. The, the, so this is what Frank Waters in the book of the Hopis said about the rattle. He says, the flat round face of the gourd represents the earth. The circle inside symbolizes the sun, whose radiant rays give it warmth and life. The swastika symbol may show clockwise rotation for the sun or counterclockwise rotation for the earth. So they knew all this, uh, you know, uh, way back. So the stick thrust through the gourd symbolizes the north and south axis of the earth, at whose ends sit the hero twins, the North Pole and South Pole, who keep the planet rotating. They mark. The markings show on the side represents the constellations in the Milky Way. So both twins consistently send out echoing vibrations. Here we go with the vibrations along Earth's axis. These constitute the real source of the noise of the rattle, whose re-echoes they're vibrating as either a signal or a warning. So when they shake that rattle, and it, it sounds like a rattlesnake, 
and they're giving you a warning. And uh, it's about Earth's direction, the Earth of the Sun, and the, the rotation of the Earth. So Stonehenge is set up just like the rattle, except it's, it's facing, back in the old days, it faced east. But you see these two uh, station stones, they call them. They, they look exactly like, like Gerald put in his painting, you know. So how, how did he know? You know, how, how did he, uh, it's amazing all these, these things, how they come together. So, so let's look at other places. Here's, here's Balbecki and, uh, you know, these 300 ton stones and, and uh, it's pointing to the North Pole around 50,000 years ago. You know, if you, here's North, South, East, there's North. If you know where East is, that's the key, then you know where North is. Here's, uh, here's uh, Anger Watt, same thing. Um, all these might help you with your, when you're studying your, your sites, you know, use your compass, you know, to, to find out where North, South, East, and West is, and then use that little, uh, you know, the, the peace sign and, and figure out where, where these things are pointing. Here's, this is down in South America, and it's, it, again, it's pointing right at our present pole. So, you know, this is the fourth world. This is when we came to the fourth world. Well, here's one in, in Africa that's uh, called Adam's Calendar, and it's got the three, three things for Alan uh, Orion, and then north, south, east, and west, and it shows the North Pole was at around 75,000 years ago. So that's an ancient, ancient uh, site. Then here's the Avenue of the Dead. Now, remember I told you that the, the Hopis watched the sunrise, you know, from the winter the 21st, uh, December 21st, but then they... The other half of the year, they're watching the sun set. Well, if you're watching the sun set, the sun's rays would come up right here, hit that, hit the, the you guys call it the pyramid of the moon, but I, I think that's still the pyramid of the sun. The pyramid of the moon should be here. And I think if you look at it from that direction with Hapgood's North Pole location, it might open up some, some avenues of research for you. So, and then you've got these, uh, uh, heads that look like African Americans, like a Negro person. Well, those are uh, 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 could have been from the Third World. So, you know, you know, different races could have lived at different places, uh, different points in time. You know, so 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 this is Poverty Point down in Louisiana. With if it was lined up with the equinox. Uh, same thing, you know, but it's, it's all over the world like that. Here's, here's your, uh, I probably pronounced this meant wrong, but Mont Alban. And if you, if it lined up with the equinox, you would see this stone, this big building out here, uh, points, you know, here's the winter solstice, the equinox and the summer solstice. Well, for some reason, they didn't put that up here on the pyramid. I don't know if it wasn't enough room or what happened, but they were trying to show you exactly where that point was and they had all these observatories and if you were standing right there on top of that pyramid the day of the equinox with your compass you'd have 12 points of reference that would go you know uh, all across that whole complex and you could tell if the earth was still in balance or if it wasn't in balance so when you look at that building j we they call it where am i at here it looks like this it's a pointed you know, we know exactly where that was pointed. So other other places might have done the same thing. Here's the, at the Golden Heights, they have a, a medicine wheel they call the Wheel of Reform. And it has the same thing, a, a, wheel, a stone there, just point right where East was. Here's a Gobateki, you've got, you've got a stone pointing exactly, you know, where the equinox was. At this El Tahan, they had so many points of reference. It was huge. I mean, it's just this, this, if, if they could measure exactly, you know, uh, by degree, you know, just if they were off just, just a little bit, they could tell, you know, where, where it was on these pyramids. I mean, they used them uh, to, to balance earth. I mean, they, they had, a, they had a system where it, it and even had little like uh, markers here that could move and, they could uh, from one one age to the next, maybe. <clears throat> and then this was like at Delphi, Greece, same same thing. If you ran, if the east was ran through the middle of the building, you'd have all these points of references to to balance the earth. 
And then at uh, New Grange, here, here you are with your serpent circles and the winter solstice, summer solstice, and the equinox. So it kind of all comes together. So if the Hopis traveled east over a large ocean, you know, that had to be, you know, the Pacific Ocean, we would have to go, you know, south to find the, where they came from. And way down in Chile, there's this Mont, Verley, Mont Verde, Chile, and it's been dated to 12,500 12, years ago, the last time the polar ice caps melted. So if, and it just so happens that down there in Chile, this, this is a car driving on a road. Here you see the ladder where they emerged up here. We got two paths, or maybe the two wobbles, or the right path and the wrong path. You know, they wanted to stay on the right path. Over here with Spider Woman. This is for Masao, the Bear Clan. Um, and here's the first world, the sun and the moon. And uh, that's a huge mural. And down there along with it is this, here I go again, at Atkama Giant in Chile. That's a huge Kachina figure uh, carved into the sand there, uh, all in Chile. So I think that the Hopis landed at Mont Verde and came north, uh, right where the Guardian told them to. So if you go back across the ocean and you come to this place, uh, Nan Madal, which I think that's where they learned how to build their rafts. The Hopis said they stopped and they had to learn how to build better rafts so they could come go across the whole Pacific Ocean. And I think that happened right there. Um, this design is the same design they still use on the posts in Akibas. You know, the roofs are like rafts above them and, uh, you know, they're, they're prepared. So if you went past Namadel, you'd come up into the Gulf of Eden and you'd come through the past. And here's a place called Masao. Uh, it's an ancient seaport right in the Red Sea, right across from Axum. And Axum is where the world's tallest uh, ob obelisks are. And uh, I think that's where they entered the water uh, in tubes and floated down, got, learned how to make the rafts. And so this, they, they, in the pyramid complex, Egypt is right up here. So how will we prove their, their theory about the earth being in different locations? Another way besides the uh, Hapgood, well, Karnak uh, has been moved four times. All of these large, huge, uh, 500, 500 yard long buildings have been moved in their, in their time of use. This is from Peter Thompson's book, uh, uh, The oh, Secrets of the Great Pyramids. He says all the temples and most of the other temples have been reconstructed during their period of use. Lexer has four defined well-marked changes in orientation. Pylons were added, more courts were added, the sanctuary was moved eastward, the front of the temple westward. So it's on page 165. So if that was lined up with the winter solstice, I'm pretty sure that was lined up with the winter solstice, the same way there and same way there. Uh, that, you know, to me that, uh, helps prove it, but uh, oh, I messed up here. So let me try to explain a mural to you, which I don't know how many people have ever done this, but I've, I'm not afraid to try, but based on the Hopi creation story, uh, the murals of Egypt, uh, you know, they've been around for thousands of years and nobody ever gave me an explanation of what they mean or, uh, you know, everybody just puts dates on them and tells you stuff about the fourth dynasty and stuff. And, but let's look at this like a Hopi would. So, so here we have a hawk on a perch. But you can see this perch, it has two legs, but one of them doesn't go all the way to the ground. So that perch is wobbling, just like they're, well, there's a prayer feather as a counterweight, just that little small amount of weight. Could be the weight of the pyramids, could be the weight of the ice caps. So that's the counterweight. He's got the moon on his head and the creator's up above and he's trying to balance, balance the hawk. And see this side's closer than this side. So it's out of balance. He's trying to wobble it. The buzzards are pulling and he's watching and the buzzards are pulling. So, so here we are on this perch and here's the, the fifth world creeping up slowly. We know this is the fifth world because 
This is the first world, second, third, here's the fourth. So this is the fifth world, the new initiate. He's, he's uh, quite creeping up slowly because time creeps up slowly. And he's got a prayer feather in his hair and he's wearing his uh, breech cloth, just like the Hopis do when they get initiated. So this is our present day. This is lots of people, our, our growing population. And we're all trying to help. We've got our hands up. We're trying to help balance that hawk. Well, here's the Neanderthals. Now they're from the third world. And here's the two twins. One's got a pyramid on her head and the other one's got the vibration. This one was for weight. This was for vibration. They're trying to help. And then here's that little mockingbird, the little guy that caused all the trouble, to, uh, keeps talking to us, our inner voice that tells us we always need more. And they brought plants. So you know this is one, two, three. They're buried three times. The, the hawk's wobbling. You can almost feel him wobbling back and forth. Everybody's trying to help. And this guy's creeping up and going to jump on him and set us all off balance. So, so that's what a, a mural in Egypt looks like to me. So if you ask, well, why the hawk? Why did they use the hawk? Well, here's the creator. And he's at a different angle than that angle I showed you before because Earth has different angles. And uh, one's right and one's wrong. And he's ready to create. And he's got a hold of a snake. And that snake, he put down his foot and he straightened out the wobble. And he's, he's ready to produce. Here's the, the dung beetle ready to rotate. But the first world, that's who represents that. The second wor world is this guy in the third world. There he is, our, uh, the, I guess you'd call him uh, the dog. And then the fourth is the hawk. So when you look, you look back at that, well, that's, that's why you have the hawk because he represents the fourth world. When you see any of these other guys, you know exactly what world, what time they represent in the scheme of things. So if you look at a mural like this, it's all about balance and time or in Egypt. So here's the nephew and he's, he's with the third world and he's teaching people about the weight of a feather against a human heart or a jar or a bag full of earth, be it the balance, you know. And here you've got your two mocking birds. And here's some new initiates. And here's the creator and spider woman. And here's the guy keeping track and then a destroyer, a guy that's half alligator, half whatever. He's a destroyer. So this is the, going on in the third world. Well, up above, here's the hawk, the fourth world. And he's got blessings and seeds and corn. And he's, he's got the people that have already been trained. And he's got, you know, guardians. And then here's some students. And here's a girl with a water jar on her head. She's bringing the water. Here's the two twins, one with the balance, one with the, the uh, vibration, another guardian, and some more twins or students, excuse me. So this tells me they were training people, young, young people, to go into the fourth world. You know, that's, that's the way I read this mural. So the prayer feather is very important to Indians. Many tribes back East had, you know, their whole headdress was covered with feathers. So all their thoughts would go up to the creator. Every Hopi vehicle has prayer feathers in it to guide your spirit. If for some reason there was an accident or uh, that's the prayer feather is very important to Native Americans. So here's another uh, interpretation of the same thing. Here's a prayer feather. The third world, you know, he's training. Here's the new initiate. He's coming in here. The trainer's uh, training him, and here's the destroyer, a prayer feather in a little jar. Here's a guy keeping track. Well, here's the fourth world. He's introducing the guy that's already been trained to the creator. Here's the creator, and he's got the twins to have his back, the two ice caps. And the prayers are coming by way of an eagle's feathers, and the, the message is coming to the creator. These guys up here, some of them have the message because they've got the life symbol and some of them don't, they have, they're not ready to go yet. So this guy's holding up his hand saying, wait, and this guy's gonna introduce him. He's gonna go up here and then they're gonna take off for the fourth world and be distributed with their guardian. So our, the, the little life symbol is very important with, as just as the weight of the feather. So that's, that's another mural over there. <laughs> So if I was going to pass this information on and I wanted to put it in a secure location and, you know, where nobody would bother, I might put it inside the king's chamber, you know, in a box. We think that's a coffin, but 
I think uh, this is what they say in Secrets of the Great Pyramid. The dimensions of the grand coffer in the King's Chamber by this professor are arranged in a perfect astronomical atlas. They measure the absolute cubic meter, which is the meter used to measure the speed of the Earth at the equator. And, but the, it was not designed as a cube, so that it's various inner outer measures to represent the various astronomical constants of the solar system. He said it was built to not only the distance from the Earth to the sun, but the weight of the Earth, the weight of the Earth and the moon, the weight of the sun in relation to the Earth, and the weight of the sun in relation to the Earth and the moon, the weight of the Earth in relation to, to the moon, the value of the meter, and the polar radius of the Earth in terms of that. So it was this box in there, they, they're trying to get this information to us. This is the distance from the Earth to the sun and the moon, and this is what each one of them weighs. And uh, you need to know that as well as pi. You know, the, the, the pyramids are all built, you know, like two pi, three pi. If you're trying to square a circle, you, maybe that's the information you need to know, you know, where we need to build the next pyramid. I don't know if we need to build one, but uh, if we did, if the earth started to wobble, I'm absolutely positive that we'd all get together and build the best pyramid we could build before we went out of balance. And I think that's happened in the past. So, so once again, here, here's another mural, it shows the, the hawk floating with the moon and the two twins, and he's on the backbone. And there's three uh, monkeys behind him, past worlds. Here's three new worlds to come. This is the fourth world he's looking at, straight at it. And here's the serpent. So he's floating just like Earth. Oh, I missed it again. Okay, and here's one. It's here's the third world, and he's putting the first world to to bed. He's dead. He passed away. And who's on each side? The twins, the the one with the weight and the one with the vibration, and they're rolling something, the Earth. So that they're they're trying to tell us what what's going on, and they use this dung beetle because he takes a piece of dung and he uh, puts it into a perfect circle. And then he lays his eggs on it, rolls it someplace and buries it. And that's for his offspring. Well, that's, that's just what the creator did. He, he created our earth. He put us on here. And, uh, you know, he's watching us as we uh, just uh, take care of it, you know, do our thing. So, but that's why they use that dung beetle, I think. It, it wasn't. Uh... So here's another a version of it. Here's the first world's gone three times. You got the buzzard and the snake. But this time, see, the, the twins don't have arms. They're not trying to help. Well, once he goes up to the fourth world, then they're trying to help. There's the balance, and here's the prayer feathers. So uh, this is rejuvenation and death. So um, so let me, uh, well, this, this just, I just wanted to show you down, down south. See, they have him with a string of time. And here's the, value, the, the backbone, same kind of, their guardian have, have tried to teach them the same lesson in the past. Here, all these ancient civilizations went through this same uh, uh, learning curve. Uh, you know, the, the pyramid, if, if the, the, the weight of the pyramid isn't enough to support this, the little fellow down here is gonna get crushed. So uh, that's what this is about. Um, I know you guys know more about this than I do, but I just think it resembles the same thing. In Egypt, they have a, a mural of a man sitting on a, a stack of corn. You know, like I said, corn doesn't grow in the wild. So they brought corn here with him. He's, he's uh, germinating it. He's playing his uh, turkey bone whistle, just like the Hopis do. And then Hopi, this is from the book of the Hopi. I, you know, she, She's on corn and she's doing the same thing during their ceremony today. They do this same, same ceremony today. So let's look at this big mural. This, this is from Ramsey's tomb and it's on the third level, third, third world. And you see that up here, he's got eight, eight worlds where man is upside down. He said he'd only fix seven. So, so we're going to, the seven, eighth time, he's not going to help at all. So here's seven craters and he's on top of a snake seven times. And here's the five constellations he didn't use. He has arrows going through them. 
And here's the crater and he's very mad. He's, the snake has many wobbles in it. Here's the rotation. So, so uh, that's your 12 constellations. Down here, he's, he's tried to balance the earth four times. He's, he's bent over backwards is what I would call it. He's got the earth on his stomach and he's bent over and he's and there's four to go, but he's only gonna fix three more that he's not gonna do the eight. Then here's man dancing with the snake and that's in August, the hottest month of the year. Two sides, man has two sides and he's gonna roll over. So this is one, two, three. Here's the fourth time. We're gonna hit the end of our path. He's not gonna create and the beetle's gonna roll. And the crater's waiting here. He's got the life symbol on a little Kachina figure. And he's got food and blessings. And here's Spider-Woman and the nephew waiting to go into the fifth world. So, so that's the way I'd read that mural. I don't know how many people have tried to explain that to you or not, but I, I believe that's what it means. I, uh, when I see a guy upside down, I think it means he's upside down. You know, so, uh, but now that little, the little where he's standing on top, um, this figure right here, I think they... If you blew that up, this is what it would be. It'd be your the two snakes, the two directions, your uh, 12 constellations, the sun and the moon, the crater up on top taking his rest, and the two snakes going in either direction. Just, just the earth can go in either direction. So if you believe that, and then you, and you remember our circle of the two uh, orbits, well, this mural, it's uh, what they call it, uh, the astronomical ceiling or something, but uh, to me, it's all about a balance. See, here's, here's your balance. It's just like the other things in Egypt. It's all about balance. Here's the nephew down here. He's got seven on one side, eight on the other, or nine on the other. And here's Orion, and he's spearing the bull, the constellations. And when he does that, this, this circle is going to move over here. And that we, you know, there's the fourth, fifth, the sixth, the seventh time the crater's going to be on top. And then this will be in perfect balance. It'll be six over here and six over here. And uh, that's, that's the way it looks to me. And I think it's, it's, it's again, in the pyramid complex is the same thing as our, that first chart I showed you, the Hopi ceremonial cycle. But this is going clockwise, and it shows the, the uh, crater's pyramid, which is the tallest pyramid. He's had three satellite pyramids in front of him to create. So uh, the last time one of these moved down here and we moved from here to here. This is his timepiece. The Sphinx is right up here marching through it. And uh, so the, the fourth world has three worlds behind it. And we're, we're on the land, uh, you know, on the line of going from the fifth to the sixth. So that's, that's the way he's got it set up. So if uh, this is where the Sphinx is at, the pyramid, the Great Pyramid, it stands right here, and this backs up to it. I would imagine there's an entrance in here somehow, but I, I don't know. But when I look at this with the Hopi creation story in mind, this, this uh, the Valley Temple looks to me like a male figure. He could only count to three. He was from the third world. The people could enter here and, you know, go through this the direction of the earth um, and you know, two four six and then two four six yeah. no eyes to see no legs this is like a hieroglyph it's a, a big temple and i think the people entered here before the 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 fire and the uh the ice knew what direction the earth was going went all the way down here to what we call the mortuary temple which is a, a terrible name. Uh, I think it represents Spider Woman. It's a female figure. Um, this is the fourth world. She's got four feathers in her headdress. Here's her two eyes. This is the symbol of power up on the reservation, what the, what the Hopis use to stimulate power, to stimulate it. And she's got a huge womb area with a navel, with an obelisk. And uh, so the Sphinx is located straight east of her and uh, the Sphinx Temple, I think that's the egg, like an em embryo. You can see his two little eyes. Here's his, his uh, hands coming up. He's, he's like an egg, a little uh, 
uh, chick too young to fly. Well, he has an obelisk. So if you went underground from, from the navel of the female figure, like the, the uh, umbilical cord, you would go straight underneath the Sphinx. And I think that's when it came out of the pyramid, they went underground and we came right up here, traveled east out of, out of the Sphinx temple. And these temples are huge. The, the stones weigh 300, 400 tons. And, and I think that's what that represents, life, death, and rebirth. It's our, it's our cycle of life. And up in KV5, there's another, what I would call hieroglyph. It's, it's a, a huge underground. They've only un, undug you know, half of it so far. But there's an Osiris figure right here. I think if you dug behind that, you might find another chamber. But here's his arms, goes down into his, his uh, body. He has six on one side and seven. There's the seventh one here. And there's a, the penis is uh, the doorway, the, the, the stairway. And I would wonder where that would point at at the time of uh, December 21st, where up in the heavens it points, because I think that might give us a clue where people came from. He's got six weights on each side and he's got leggings just like a Hopi wears and there's his feet. So to me, that, that would represent a male figure just, and it's right there in the Valley of Kings close to, to a Tutankhamun's uh, burial chamber. So you have to remember that uh, the creator was going to leave the nephew here. So if if the nephew was Tutankhamun, he might have died young. He was a young nephew, and that might be his burial chamber. Well, the uh, Spider Woman's temple might be between, uh, you know, the, what we call the Hall of Records. Could be right underneath in that in that chamber would go right underneath the sphinx to the sphinx temple there might be a chamber there that uh, holds this information a little better than i'm describing it so but if you look at the total valley of the kings uh, uh you know what the what they've already dug up you can see the outline of there's taurus you know here's gemini the constellations are on one path and the other you know they're all right here and they would know right where to dig if, if they just paid attention to the Hopis and uh, realized that it's not a valley of kings. They only found one king, and that was Tutankhamun, and that was the nephew. And, uh, you know, they could, I think it plots out all the constellations, and uh, it, it's not, you just get a, 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 di a, a plate of the constellations and lay it over the, the temple, the underground uh, diggings, and you can tell right where, you know, right where these things are. So, um, so there again, that's the same thing that Mensas they were trying to tell us. Now the, the Lakota use that same information, the Cyrus, uh, the Orion, and the Pleiades, that's their white buffalo they're waiting for as he rises up. So they're waiting for him to come back. <clears throat> and those circles that we see over in Egypt, what they needed was a, a way of finding direct east. And you'd find east by finding north. You know where north is. And if you go through that little doorway, you could come in there and you'd, you'd put your instrument down. You had to have a fake wall. And uh, they could use the exact position of the astronomical north by setting position on, on a star using this balance and a, and a weight. They did this in Egypt. They did it in Mexico. And they did it at Chaco Canyon, and they did it at Wapatki. Wapatki is um, uh, north of uh, north and east of Flagstaff, out here in the middle of the desert. And uh, there's no reason for him to try to live there, but there was a ruin there, and he had there was two of these circles. Well, the two circles are just like these two circles. I think you'd measure the equinox. Uh, at both those. For some reason, they need two. I don't know uh, exactly why, but um, you know, somebody smarter than I am should know that. But if you look at the whole Hopi mesas and the villages with Wapatki in mind, there's Wapatki out here, here's Flagstaff. You see that the Hopi villages are actually first, second, third mesa or Orion's belt. And then you've got your Canyon de Shea. And uh, over here is Betacanand, which is, uh, they claim it's Navajo uh, 
monument. It's it's Navajos never built one of those monuments in their life. They uh, they live in Hogan's little uh, octagons. Uh, these are Hopi ruins, and it should be Hopi, you know, inscription house. And, um, I don't know. I read her. I wrote her a letter, told her about it, but she's not listening to me. They have a Native American gal running the uh, interior department, and she could change that name, and she should because actually they it forms Orion, and that also uh, tells you that the Hopis know what they're talking about, that their creation story is true. Here's Hamalavi, which is outside of Winslow, where I grew up, and then. Walnut Canyon's a ruin that's out on a cliff that's way above the water, Wapatki, and then goes right to the, what we call the navel is Supai, which is down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And if you follow Ryan's belt to the east, you come to Chaco Canyon, and here's Cyrus, and then you know Santa Fe, New Mexico, Taos, all these ancient sites, uh, Acoma, uh, form these same constellations we've been talking about. And when the Hopis dance, they they use the same information to leave a space there. And, and that space is uh, because they, they know that world was destroyed and they're hoping the next world won't be destroyed and the circle will be complete, you know, so so we're they're hoping. So the burden they carry is they they still have the hope we still have to carry this burden, this stone tablet, and here's the, the circles and the, the uh, they're, they're, uh, that might be his hair, I don't know, but it looks like a stone circle, but he's he's carrying the stone and uh, going through the constellations and they've, they've carried this burden with him. And this is what the stone looks like from the book of the Hopi. This is the fire clan tablet. And it's all the things we talked about, you know, the end of the path, the sun, the earth's rotation. And when he broke that corner off, it really upsets you don't know what was there. And there's also uh, nothing here where, where Frank Waters, I think he knew something was there, but he, he was scared to put it there. And on the other side of the stone, uh, you know, this is the uh, division symbol for the fourth world. The beheaded man is, is if they ever change their religion, uh, the, whoever tries to change it, they're going to be heading. I hope these uh, aren't a forceful people, but they're not going to let anybody change their religion. And I, I, I know that. And, uh, and these symbols are for the three people that are going to bring the information. And, and we didn't know anything until one of the elders was so tired of waiting and he knew the ice caps were melting and he, he formed a replica of what the stone would look like if they ever had this broken off piece. And I was amazed when I saw this, but uh, you can see where he broke that piece off. Well, here's two snakes crossing a path. Same, same thing we're talking about. The, two, the earth's tilt, the two, the two paths. Uh, that's the information. And Frank Waters left off this nine pointed circle with a pyramid inside. And it's got a snake. I know it's hard to see, but there's a snake going around the pyramid. And there's the end of the path, the sun and the rotation. So the other side, here you go again, is it's a serpent and, and it crossed its own path. So um, that's, and I think, I, I, I think that the only place on earth I know where their uh, guardians are protecting a stone is in Axum, there by, you know, the Red Sea. And every year they bring it out with this red box and parade it around, but I think, it's just a little ha little cornerstone of the, the Hopi tablet. And if they had the, the uh, Ten Commandments, uh, wouldn't they want to share that with everybody on earth? But if they just had this little corner of a stone, they, they're waiting for their brother to come back and get them and tell them and bring it over to Hopi. And I think that's, he should meet them. And the day they're supposed to meet is December 21st. Uh, they walk up the trail to Old Garibe. And they're waiting for him. They've been waiting for him for hundreds of years. So I hope uh, I hope he realizes that. When I when I see a replica of the uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, I see uh, you know Hopi eagle dancers and San Ildefonso eagle dancers. There, they uh, that's who's on top of it. I mean, these guys. That's exactly the way they dress. That's uh, what they do. So. 
So these are just some thoughts. There was a, a French guy that started uh, with that's that stated that Saturn completes one procession greater cycle every 864 years. There you go, your 864 years. So if we just watch Saturn, we know that a half cycle, 432, and a quarter cycle every 216, or you know, an, you know, of an age, and the eighth cycle, 108, which is the diameter of the moon. So 864,000 miles is the diameter of the sun. 864 seconds in a 24 hour day. So we travel 86,400 cubics at the equator each day. So this, this cycle we're in, it's, it's, we're all connected to it every day, every minute. Um, so the pyramid was built at uh, one to four, three and 20 of the diameter of the earth. There is your 432. Uh, for the period of Mexico was built four times larger for the fourth world. We breathe 18 times a minute. So we breathe about 25,920 breaths per day. Our heart beats, you know, one time per second on average. So it beats 86,400 beats every day. So we're connected to this cycle with every breath we take and every beat of our heart. You know, we just don't know about it. And they just discovered that Saturn's missing a moon. So, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I, I don't know where our moon came from, but I know Saturn's missing one. And uh, NASA just sent this little space rocket up there and actually uh, changed the orbit of, a, of, a, of, a, of an asteroid, which uh, tells me that these things aren't that hard to change their orbit or to move them around up there. So uh, this is a painting, <clears throat> one of my favorites. It's, it's by Gerald again, and it's just a Hopi man and woman that are uh, deeply in love. They've been connected, their brains, their thoughts, their sight, uh, they love each other. Uh, a lot of Hopis have been married 50, so I know I've been married 60, 70 years. <laughs> Just tells you how old I am. Uh, they think the same, they see the same, they speak the same. Here's the sun, here's our path, the stars, here's the corn is what keeps them together, their, their love and the blue corn. Uh, Gerald says this is the, the genetic code of corn. So, you know, you know, and here's a bundle of prayer feathers, the earth, the four races, and uh, that's that's the way he thinks. And this is the way uh, Neil David, my one of my close friends, he he's a genius coming from faraway places to guard guardians that to train the Hopis and uh, to lead them on the right path. So the four books I read, everything's four in Hopi. Is the book of the Hopi by Frank Waters, which is a good book. Uh, you just have to have an open mind and, and uh, just try to fill in the blanks when they talk about the twins. Think about the ice caps. Uh, the Secrets of the Great Pyramid by uh, Tompkins is very good. Uh, it, it really uh, it lets you know that the uh, Egyptians didn't really build the pyramids. They, they really did more harm to them than anything. They took all those capstones off and built their city of Cairo. And it might have took them 20 years to do it. And they probably used those little wooden hammers and copper chisels, but they didn't build, you know, they, you had to know a lot to build those things. And they, they, they don't know anything about this cycle I'm talking about. Path of the Poles by Hapgood and Einstein, and then Message of the Sphinx by Hancock and Duvall. They, that's where you get your, uh, what the Sphinx is for. So, so let's see, my, this is my email address. If you want to raise heck with me, or <laughs> whatever you want. You'd like to ask me any questions. Uh, the big myth is that no one plants or harvests on December 21st or June 20th. You know, I grow gardens and I don't plant in June. I, you know, and I don't plant in December. I set the first copy of my little book, Al Gore, 1998, you know, when I first, these thoughts started coming to me. And all of a sudden he got real interested in the ice caps, but he did never mention the Hopis or give me any credit. And, uh, these words I try not to use, uh, Anastasia, ancient aliens, extraterrestrial, hunter-gatherers. These, my Hopi friends, they're not hunter-gatherers. They knew what they were doing. They know how to garden. They, they knew where they're at. They know where we're going. Uh, the Spanish didn't really discover the Grand Canyon. The Hopis took them there. So in 53 years, I've, I've known the Hopis. I've never seen a Hopi strike his child or anybody else's child. They, they love their children. They love 
humanity. So, so anyway, I'm sorry I took so long, but I've tried to get a little bit of information out there to you, and uh, that's what I think. And so, uh, if you have any questions, I'm I'm happy to answer any. Well, thank you, Thomas. That was uh, quite interesting, <laughs> and uh, tying it into Egypt. I, I just want to point out I have uh, another bag of, of feathers ready to send you. And uh, as um, Thomas mentioned, he grows tobacco for his Hopi friends. And, and I periodically send him bags of feathers that he, he sends to them in a sort of symbiotic uh, relationship. <laughs> well, they, they use every feather. Yeah, they use uh, every one. And interesting, you're tying the Hopi in with Egypt, <clears throat> and most of these feathers are from Egyptian ibis and Egyptian geese. They so would love it. Yeah. Yeah. Please let them know that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I haven't seen too many questions, but one here is do the solstice angles vary with latitude? Do the solstice angles? Um, I think so. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I would think so. I know they, they have to find that exact right spot to build, to build one of those calendars. Cause, uh, uh, you have to have, think about the moon also. So, um, I think, I think it does. Yeah. I think it changes. You have to be at a certain place on earth in the same line with the where it would hit yeah you know? right what's hard to understand is that this has happened three times that the guardians have went with people and tried to teach them and you know and then we were destroyed and then they started over again and people moved and um you know that's 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 where these guys that like right now in our space our our space station up there we've got one woman and 10 men well if something happened here on earth what what plan do they have what uh, you know that that's not a very good plan i mean you'd have to you have to look at things uh more realistically i think i i don't think we're thinking correctly yet but um we have one comment from ricky ray who i think has left us here but <clears throat> He's, he says he spent many days for 20 years working at Second Mesa for the power company, and he loves the Hopi culture. Oh, uh, good to hear from him. I'm glad he did. Yeah. yeah. Other people, Andra, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Jimena, great presentation. Jason says, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thanks for viewing this Aslander video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive free monthly issues of the Aslander e-magazine. Contact your host Jim Reed at myaman at bellsouth.net. Thanks again.